Thank you, x -Mister. Yay! <laughs> okay, thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Scott Grove. I'm from New York, so I'm sure I don't have an accent. You all have an accent, but um, I want to thank Axminster for having me over here to uh, demonstrate the easy inlay line. Uh, I am a 45, I'm dating myself, year uh, full-time woodworker. I specialize in veneer and inlay, and through that process, um, I've uh, started another company with my wife uh, for inlay. It's called Easy Inlay. Easy Inlay makes inlay easy. So what we're here today is to just kind of talk about uh, a little bit of the line, but I want to get kind of right into it. We're going to uh, show you how to do an inlaid ring. Um, they carry the uh, ring line either in their pre-channeled rings, uh, and you can see them here. So they come in ceramic in a variety of sizes. And again, they have a size chart and ring sizes here. I don't know the metric or UK conversion because that's, you know, a little confusing for me. Or Bacote, which is an exotic uh, wood that also comes pre-channeled. So what makes this easy is you don't have to bother trying to turn your ring. You can just sort of find the ring that you want and do an inlay. The inlay techniques that I'm going to be demonstrating will also work for uh, bowls. If any, any, we have any turners here? Any turners? We got one turner, two turners. So you can use that for uh, inlaying um, bowls and what have you. And if you do flat work, you know, chess boards or tables or whatever. So it's very versatile. Um, the two products that I'm going to demonstrate primarily will be doing the inlay strips. So the, this is uh, actually Power Shell, Power Abalone, which it comes in New Zealand. We have a supplier, we're licensed to export that from New Zealand. And also Abalone, I mean, sorry, Mother of Pearl, which is also South Pacific Shell. Uh, there are a variety of colors, and there's a whole line of colors oh, on this table right here, so if you want to look at that. In addition, we're going to be uh, showing some, I'll just grab it off this table because this is a lot easier. Uh, we also carry um, a cultured um, opal. So cultured opal is actually real opal, but it's lab grown. So it's a, it's a crystal and it's lab grown. It's not plastic in any way. In fact, this will hold its color better than real opal because real opal has moisture trapped inside the stone. And that's what gives the fiery iridescence. And over time, if you actually have real opal, you should store it in water or mineral oil so it won't dry out because real opal actually dries out. It loses that moisture and the fire goes away. This stuff, they, when they grow it, they don't put moisture in. They, that 5% of moisture are replaced with resin. So there is some resin in here, but molecularly it's the same. There's only one factory in Japan that grows this stuff and it takes 10 months to grow a uh, I say quarter inch, so that's six mil. Sorry, I got to do my conversions here. Uh, a slab, and then they crush it up. So, and this also comes in a variety of colors. And what first attached me, you know, attracted me to this is that when I take some of my turnings, okay, fine, I make a little paper clip tray or something, and yeah, whatever, thanks, Ma, you know, another present. But by putting a little groove in here and sprinkling the opal in with a little CA glue, the Siren Acrylate Super Glue and turning it down, you can see it takes it to a whole nother level. It makes it like a piece of jewelry. And then you get a lot of wows. I mean, that's what I do. And we can pass this one around here. If people want to see what that looks like. So very easy to do. And of course, the material, we also have a, a metal leaf that we won't be demonstrating, but there's a lot of materials. Uh, and we have videos online that uh, Axmist is starting to load up. And pen turners, I'll pass these pens around. I'll just pass a couple of these. So these are also some pens um, used in uh, with our material. And again, you can mix the material with any resin of choice, super glue or CA glue, epoxy, urethane. Uh, there's a variety of uh, materials, very universal. So with all that said, I'm going to jump right into it. If uh, you can't understand my accent, raise your hand, let me know. I'm happy to, uh, I've got a translator here, my best friend Carden, who's I grew up with in New York. He now lives in London. So um, again, thanks Carden for driving me here. Um, so the other thing is now I have a big shop and all the fancy tools and feel free to shop around the store and buy all those fancy tools. And with that said, I'm going to show you a, a way to do this with minimal tools. I think it's important to kind of 
make it as easy you can, and I might reference other methods that are more advanced or more advanced tools, but I want to make this as simple as possible. So we're just going to use a cordless drill and, and make a really nice inlaid ring for you. Um, so the first thing is obviously you're going to want to uh, try your, get your ring size using a ring chart and uh, select your ring. And now I have to put my eyes on. Here we go. So I have a ring that I want to use. Oh, it's right here. Um, so what you need to do is first make something called a ring mandrel. Now you can buy ring mandrels online, but I, I found you can just sort of make your own. And depending on the size of the ring, might, de might depend on what type of ring mandrel you make. And we have plans, ring mandrel plans were right here. And of course I don't see them. So we'll, they'll show up. We printed them out. Well, anyhow, online, there's a series of plans. Here's an example of a ring station that uh, made. So there's plans online that will show you um, how to make a ring mandrel. And also we have written instructions of everything that I'm going to be included here. And that's all that will be on the Axminster site. But bottom line, it's you just kind of go to a hardware store or plumbing supply and just Plunk around and look at the variety of washers they have, depending on the size of the ring. These are um, faucet washers. We've all seen the you know rubber corks work work really great, and you can simply drill a hole through there, and then we'll be sanding it down. And by putting a uh, a washer and a nut on here, if I crank this, it will just expand this ever so slightly and grab the ring. So that's pretty much how that how that works. And uh, obviously getting the, the size right. So um, what I've done here is you have a cordless drill, um, you know, clamp it down so it's secure. And if you have these quick clamps, you can even control the speed, right? A little bit at a time. So that's one easy way of making a variable speed. Obviously a corded drill, some corded drills actually have a dial on there. You can actually dial in, that makes it a little easier. So that would be better, uh, but you can get away with this. So what I simply do is take my starting washer configuration. This one is actually fender, the, the plumbing washers. This is sort of the cork. And I, I just sort of fit this. This is one that they made up for me. So it's a little too small, which was intentional, I hope. And um, you simply want to sand this and the rubber sands real easy and I can simply sand this thing down like that and I just kind of keep pushing this until this fits on here now I'm going to sort of cheat and not have you watch me sand as much as I like and that's why I'm just going to come back over here uh, another thing that I like to do is take a little plumber's tape uh, teflon tape and wrap Teflon tape around here because we are going to be working with CA glue and you want to kind of prevent gluing the ring to the mandrel. And if you do, acetone will dissolve CA glue. So if you ever get in a job uh, in a jam or glue your finger to your face, you know, acetone will, will dissolve that. Then what I would do is simply take a pair of pliers and screwdriver. Well, and I'm just going to tighten this a little bit. The one thing that I do want to mention is that this is wood. It does have grain. So if you crank this too much, you're going to expand that washer and you will break the ring. Now, um, for me, that's actually a good thing because I work with my hands and I actually don't wear rings. And when I do I'll only wear wooden or ceramic, because if you fall off a ladder or catch it on a table edge, it won't de-glove. You don't want to even Google that. It, if you ever have seen a ring, it takes everything off. It's horrible. So these rings are designed to break or they're intentionally to, to break. So they are, you know, fragile in that sense. But you can see I can, you know, bang this around pretty well. It's not like they break by looking at them. But if you crank this too much, they will pop. If they do pop, you can actually glue it back together. And, hold on, right here. I don't know if you can see this, but I take thread. This one actually broke, and the brakes are usually very clean, so I just hold it together, put a little CA glue, and I wrap thread around it. And then I put another layer of CA glue and actually glue this down. And actually, the string makes it actually stronger than just the raw wood itself. So if you want a stronger 
um, uh, ring, you can do that. But again, keep in mind if you're working with your hands or not. So that's one way around this. So um, we certainly start with that. One thing, another thing that I would like to do if I want to make this ring, I'm going to do it with another ring since that one's, I'll do it on this one, is um, uh, I usually soak these with CA glue, thin CA glue, just soak the whole ring and let that sort of soak in. That will also uh, wick into the fibers and make the ring a little stronger. So you have a little control of, of the strength of the ring if that's an issue. I don't always do that because, again, I want my rings to break if, if I'm wearing them. So that's another... Uh, another little great tip. Um, the next thing I want to do, solvent. Do we have solvent? Denature alcohol? I'll just talk it through. You can, I, I'm a great mime, so you can, um, you can understand what I'm doing here. So what I would do is take this ring and I would wipe it with some denatured alcohol, lacquer thinner, acetone, even mineral spirits. The reason being is there might be some surface oils on this. This is an exotic wood and you want to make sure you sort of dry and, and, and get all those surface oils off. That's the first thing that you'd want to do. Then in this case, I'm going to chuck this up into the drill. And I would take a popsicle stick and a little sandpaper, and I'm going to um, put this on here and just sand the bottom of the surface there. That just gets a little tooth, again, helps pull off those oils. But if you just sand it without cleaning, you're just going to smear those oils around. So it's really important to sort of dry that off. And since we don't have any alcohol, we're just going to... I have a saying, nothing's ever learned by doing it right. So uh, since we don't have any uh, denatured alcohol, we'll see. Actually, I've done this a lot. We would use methylated spirits. Yes, methylate. You guys call it spirits. That is not denatured alcohol. Yeah, methylated spirits. Same thing. Right, spirits. Yeah, spirits. Woo. So, so now we have a, um, a nice um, clean ring, has some tooth in it, and I'm ready to start installing the inlay. So, um, oh, that's what I was looking for. So having a ring station, uh, this is just one they made simple, but if you're, if you're kind of getting into it, again, we have plans here. I like to have it a little higher, you know, that's why this one's raised up, and having little cups for toothpicks and all your little supplies makes it a little easier. You can usually make that out of scrap, but that's okay. Oh, side note. You can tell I'm ADD a little bit and dyslexic. So uh, imagine grow or imagine woodworking is my personal landing page that will take you to other of these things. If nothing's on Axminster and you're looking for more information, go to that site and you can uh, access other other um, things. So here we're going to be using the natural the natural um, power shell. So this is it here. Ooh, ah. This is actually has a urethane coating on it and it also has a PSA, a pressure sensitive adhesive on the back. Now power shell is shell. It's a brittle and I just glued myself to the floor. <laughs> um, power shell is a shell so it is brittle and when you start bending this around you're going to hear a little cracking. That's normal and it won't show up in the final finish. Also, there's natural inclusions in here, so it just kind of blends in. On smaller rings, what I often like to do is take the, 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 the power shell and roll it on a, on a dowel or something. So I'm getting more even cracking instead of like putting on here my crack here and then I'll crack 90 degrees. I rather have three or four cracks because what you don't want is you don't want a, a crack to happen with a void underneath. You want this thing to lay down as much as possible. So by pre sort of bending it and cracking it is, is a great thing to do. And then what I do is take off the PSA. Now, can you, I don't know what camera we were good. You guys can kind of see this. I'll move this over. Most of the work will be doing over on a drill, but I take a popsicle stick And I peel this off, and I just place it on here. And I kind of like working on, on this sort of workstation. I can press down a little harder, I can rotate it, and I can simply put this in. A couple sort of tricks is rocking 
the popsicle stick. Again, that ensures you're getting the entire surface. You don't want to sort of pull, you know, one sort of instinct is like, oh, I'll pull this and wrap it around, but you can break it apart. If you do, just sort of push it back together again. But um, it's nice of you to sort of work your way around. I'm going to pull this PSA tape off and sort of come all the way around. And I just kind of peek underneath. If you want to know, you can use the magic marker and draw on the Teflon tape to kind of know where that, that level is. What I don't do is try to butt the seam. It's I, I, it, inevitably one out of 10, it's going to be short, right? And then there's going to be a little black line there. I just overlap it. The material's so thin that an overlap and then you just cut it, you're not going to see that in the final product. So I just sort of make sure I'm overlapped. I usually use an X-Acto knife you guys, or scalpel. You guys use scalpels over here. What do you call an X-Acto knife? Do you even know what an X-Acto knife is? It's a scalpel. Okay, anyhow, it's a brand. So it's a much finer point, but again, I can just cut this. I'm also looking for any natural uh, grain or inclusion. You know, sometimes these have angled lines, and if it does, cut along one of those angled lines. That helps also hide that sort of seam. So I'm going to kind of just cut this right here. And instead of dragging my knife, I'm going to stab it in a dotted line. Again, it makes it a much cleaner, cleaner way to, to cut this. And I can simply pull that off. Now I'm going to go around one more time and make sure that this thing is, is down. And is it focused? I can't tell if it's in focus. Are we good? So I don't know if you can see the seam. I certainly can't, but uh, it's right here. I don't know if you can see. No, I cut an angle. That's it. Those are actually, you know, I can't even see the seam. Man, I'm good. Oh, there it is. Okay. I don't know if you can see it, but it's there. But there it is. Inlay made easy. Yay. Okay. So any questions on those first steps? Well, good. Okay, we're gonna keep motoring along. So again, at this point, if you have a lathe, you can put this in a lathe. You can also do this, even if you don't have a cordless drill, you can do this manually, just like this, with CA glue. Um, you wanna keep it moving, so you become kind of a glass blower. Like if I put a bead on here, you gotta sort of keep moving it around and, and what, until it cures, or we're gonna use accelerator, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, but you can do this entire process without a drill. A drill certainly makes it a lot easier. Okay, so you guys are in a wet zone. I'm just letting you know. So we should get a plastic piece of plastic up here. So I'm going to put in a drill and I'm going to go ahead and um, just scuff this one more time. So now I want to get a little tooth on that urethane. Oh, I'm sorry. Back up. It would have been easier. We'll do it on this one. A little too much coffee and not enough sleep. Um, well, you can do it one way. The f easiest way is to take this before you inlay it, just sand it like that, right? A lot easier, huh? But no big deal. Nothing's ever learned by doing it right. So if you miss that step, you can put this in here and I can simply sand it this way. Same sort of thing. I'm just getting a little tooth on there. And this ring is slipping, so I wanted to find those pliers, which are right here. And we had a flathead screwdriver in one of these. Oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> so I'm going to grab this. Again, just a little turn. You don't need to crank this thing. I don't want to. I don't want to expand that too much. Okay, so I now have a, a nice uh, a roughed up surface. Again, if there's dust on there, I would take a little spirits and I would squirt a little spirits on there and try to just wipe that off. But I think that'll be fine. I didn't put too much dust on there. So next thing is the CA glue. CA glue, siren acrylate glue, um, is super glue. Um, all CA glues are um, moisture cured. So it's the humidity in the air that, that, that cures these. So as a side note, 
Um, some people say, oh, store your CA glue in a refrigerator, cool, dry place, right? Um, that's true and false. Unopened bottles, it's best to store in a refrigerator, cool, dry place. If you open it up, don't put it back in the refrigerator. The reason being is I have now, you know, a quarter of the bottle has warm, moist air inside that bottle. If I put it in a refrigerator, it's going to condense that moisture out of the air, drops in, and kick your CA. So it'll shorten the shelf life of your CA glue. Uh, what I do is I take a um, coffee can and I put my CA bottles in there with a plastic lid and I take some of those little desiccant packs you get with every electronic gizmo you, you buy every other week, right? And I just throw them in there. That sucks the moisture out of the air, gives you a, a dry environment. So there's a little tip on that. Also, CA glues come in a variety of um, hotness, if you will, meaning are they fast kicks or slow kicks. Um, you can get accelerators. And um, depending on the brand, now I'm kind of going blind here, so we're going to do a test. Um, so I, I often will test CA, like I already did this once before, and I'm exaggerating here, but I want to know how hot it is. So if I put a bead of CA glue, and if I put that much CA, is it going to cure it? If you put too much accelerator on some brands, most brands actually, um, it will, what's called bloom. It's a thermal runaway. It's kicking too fast. So this is curing. It doesn't matter if it crinkles on the top because I'm going to be saying that smooth. But if I do this and I put too much CA on there, thermal runaway. Okay. So it'll bloom or blush and turn white. And that's bad. <laughs> I think there's no other way of saying that. So just be careful about how much there, and it's kind of good. I good idea to get a sense of how much I can spray on there. That will make the project go faster, but you don't um, have to do this. If you have overnight, you can put CA and, and let it, the drill just keep turning and, and just let it cure overnight. That's actually, you know, probably even better. But we're in a hurry here because I got the thither yeah, that place. I got a cold beer waiting for me, so I'm uh, actually at the ale. Do they have the draft, the pump? Oh, they don't have that in the states. We you pump. Can take warm beer out. No, oh, I love it. That's like that's my my favorite. So anyhow, okay. So the configuration here. I've clamped this down, and I'm going to use this as a variable speed, and I'm going to um, just get this kind of going. Oh. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some CA first and hit it on there. Now I want that to dry because you don't want to put CA into, CA into wet accelerator because that will in fact bloom or blush it. But what this does is it sort of neutralizes the surface because um, getting back to how it kicks, it's not the moisture that kicks it, it's the alkalinity. So we have an acid and a base, and water is a base. So it, it's actually, that's what's kicking the CA glue. So if you're working with CA on acidic wood, uh, like, I don't know, cherry or, or red oak, those are very um, acidic woods. They have a lot of tannins in it. And if you put CA on it, it will uh, sometimes not kick the CA, because you're thinking, oh, I got a bad CA and I'm going to throw it away, which is great. And come back to Axminster and buy some more. But if you want to save a little money, you take um, your accelerator and spray the wood, or you can use baking soda and water to wipe it on there. And that neutralizes the acidity in the wood. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm kind of doing here. If there's any acidity on the surface, uh, I'm just kind of helping it cure. And if I put too much CA, a big thick bead, and I accelerate it from the top, I'll cure the surface and then it has to sort of migrate down. So now I want to, and you can also trap, it can actually slow the CA cure down because um, you're entrapping the gases and, and you, you can't, it won't cure faster. So if I cure it from the bottom up, right, that's what I'm doing tonight. Um, that's a better way of, 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 of doing it. So I've kicked this, it's uh, sort of dry. We're gonna go ahead and put this baby back on and now I'm gonna add the CA. And I'm just going to put a... Just a thin bead on there. 
I could in fact load this up. Now this is also medium, so the CA comes in a variety of thicknesses. Thin, medium, I don't think they carry thick. Some companies carry gel. I like the medium. I think the thick sometimes takes longer. I'd rather just put multiple layers of medium as opposed to the thick. But they all have their uh, applications. So I'm gonna put this on here. And now um, I'm gonna just hit it with a little CA and just let that go. That's probably cured enough. And again, I don't know the CA. So I'm running blind here. So that's already hard. Another little trick is if you take a popsicle stick and put packing tape around it, uh, that will um, help you sort of manipulate the CA without it sticking all over the wood. Like in fact, if I put a big bead on there, like, oh, I put too much. You know, you can use this little trowel to sort of trowel it out. Um, we also like these applicator tips, which you guys carry. These are really great because they just, if you ever try to use the regular tip, you're gonna put a drop on there and it's gonna splatter all over the place. These give you a lot more control. And the beauty of this is that these are sort of self-sealing. I don't, I never use the lids anymore. I mean, this might cure, I already cut this off, and it might harden up there and I can just cut it with a knife and I got a fresh tip so you can get a, you can keep working and you don't have to keep putting the lids on and then it will get gummy down here. I just leave it like this. And the fact that it's so small, a lot of oxygen can't get down there. So actually these don't set up as fast as when you have the normal chip and you have to, you get a big drop on there and that a lot more surface area. So I'm going to go ahead and do this again. And if you don't want this, you can go ahead and put another bead on. Like that. Little CA. Um, now you don't have to be um, precise glass blowing with this technique. It's helpful if you are. So I'm gonna actually do it both ways or I think I have one that I let it drip, meaning if uh, you walk away and it's not cured, you're gonna it's gonna drip it off and you get a big bump on the bottom. You can easily sand that off. So if there is a bump, like on here, Go over, you can see that bump right there, right? So I could take um, a popsicle stick and sandpaper and, and sand it off. Although having a rotary tool really is, um, is really a great, a great way of dealing with this. So I could certainly take this rotary tool. I want to make sure you can see, I can't see. And I can grind that, grind that little drip off and then I can keep working. And I actually like to grind that off before I put the next coat on because if that drip is there and then I put another coat on, it's like making a candle. You're just gonna keep making that, that, you know, that drip more and more. So if you get a drip, no big deal, just grind it off and then continue adding your layers of CA glue. Uh, so let's go ahead and do another layer that's dry. Usually it takes uh, at least three, if not four. And I'm going to put too much on in this case here to show you that if I did put too much on, I don't know if you can see if I do it this way. See, I can trowel that. You see a little bead on there, it's forming. And this is actually a great way of um, making that CA flush with the surface. Because there's actually a couple ways you can do this. You can make your inlay, this is actually concave. I usually like to make it either flush or you can make it domed. You know, putting a bead on there actually will magnify, a bead of resin magnifies what's going on underneath. So that actually is kind of a nice, a nice technique. So there's no right or wrong answer. Just have sort of fun with it. Um, but speaking of the bead, this, this, takes a little more um, practice and speed control, but there is a sweet spot on the drill. I can't tell you what that is. It's just more by feel, but I can actually put this on here. Oh, I won't be able to because I stopped. I stopped the drill and a drip was forming, but let's see if we can do this. Now I think the drip is I don't know if you can really see it's, 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 well, you can see the drip coming around. 
what I'm getting at is that you can, in fact, apply a bead of CA at the right speed, creating a dome. And, and at the right speed, you know, if it's too slow, it'll drip. If it's too fast, it flings all over into the wet zone. Um, but it is kind of fun to try that because if you get that bead on just right, you're done. You don't need to sand or finish or polish or do anything. Um, I have an article coming out in American uh, Wood Turner uh, in February showing this process on a larger, on a larger piece. And I talk about that, that bead, but you can see an example of that. It's not easy and I don't always get it. So, but it's kind of fun to try it and you're like, ah, okay, I didn't get it this time. But every once in a while you, you get it just right because, um, it also has to do with the viscosity, the speed, but you can control the viscosity of your CA by heating it up or cooling it down. And that's all resins, in fact. You can, in fact, do this with epoxies if you want to. So if I put it in um, a double boiler or just a, a can of hot water, you know, it's going to heat it up and it'll thin the viscosity. If I'm like, ah, it's running, it's dripping off, I need a little more hang time um, or thixotropic, uh, you can put it in a refrigerator for a little bit. I know we're said don't do that, but all rules are meant to be broken. Um, and that will thicken it up. So you have a little variation there. Um, so did I spray this? I don't remember, I wasn't paying attention. Nope. And it's not a good idea to use your finger because that'll get all over the place. So do what I say, not when I do. And it's probably not curing because I put too much on. And that's why, okay, I'm gonna date myself here. Does anybody know who Julia Child is? Oh. Well, it's America, it's the UK. Julia Child was a, there's a movie about her, um, was a American cook and she uh, was just a homemaker and then she uh, started this cooking show and she would bake a casserole or something, but she would have the finished one underneath and she'd talk like, oh, oh, no, here we go, oh, and she'd pull it out and... Oh, right. That's it. So it's Blue, Blue Peter? Yeah. Okay, so I'm pulling a Blue Peter. I'm not sure if I, that's, that sounds, uh, I might get arrested if I say it in the wrong place. But um, anyhow, so there's, there's that. I've got a bunch of them made. I did it, made a bunch of these before. And we got one finished here. Okay. Oh, now this is a ceramic one. So one thing I want to mention is, um, let's just do it and you'll see what I'm talking about. So we're, we're, we've got this filled with resin, minimum three coats, four coats, whatever it takes. Now I want to go ahead and start sanding this down. Uh, you can, um, this one should have a bump on it, right? That's the one I did before. It's best to sort of, again, try to get it relatively easy. And I can do this by hand holding it. I can leave it on a drill, but I will sort of just kind of, again, take those, those high spots off kind of run this around, just trying to get a general consistency and thickness. Uh, but then after that, I will take my sandpaper and put on a little popsicle stick. Let's see if we get this thing working here. And now I'm going to start sanding and without having that bump there, you're not going to be jumping, right? And I'm going to go ahead and sand this just back and forth. And what I'm playing to, trying to pay attention to is where the glue, the glue in the ring channel, you want a nice straight, clean line. Right? And I can dome this if I want to. If you want to speed things up, because you're standing in front of a, an international crowd here, I can go ahead and even use my Dremel tool while it's spinning. And I'm coming around. And sanding that. 
And again, I'm not going to, uh, I got extra Peter Blue, Blue, okay. I'm going to pull that on you. Uh, so what I'm looking for is a nice straight line right on uh, that seam. Like right here, hold on. It's a little fuzzy, you know, so I don't know if you can see that or not. But you get a little haze, there's still CA glue on that. So you really want to sand that, all that edges down. As a side note, if you want to give this a try, I might recommend doing a ceramic ring because ceramic is harder than the sandpaper. So I can sand this, this all day long. I can sand this and you will not scratch that ceramic. Okay, it, I don't know if the Mohs hardness chart is like a nine. I mean, this is really, really hard. So uh, that's kind of a, a easy way to get started where with the ring, if you don't use uh, this, this method and you're doing it by hand, right? And you, you know, sneeze and you, you can kind of go into the wood so you can sand into the wood. So if you're working with a wooden ring, it's best that you keep this thing moving. It's harder to kind of put an indent into it. Okay, so. That's what we do. And I'm going to just um, stop there. Can I help myself? How are we doing on time? Okay, we're. That's close enough for now. And you can also, you know, if you're doing it by hand, you can also sand. Where's my other demos? Oh, here's the one. Right. Look over there. There, sanded. But you can also take this and, and sand this way if you wanted to. I know people do that. I mean, it's nothing wrong with that. Um, I often will go on vacation and as you probably tell, I can't stop moving. So, you know, when we're sitting by the lake, you know, I got a little popsicle stick and I will play, you know, with inlays and stuff. I just, just what I do. So I now have this whole thing sanded. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So for the rough sanding, I'm starting with um, 120 or 180 grit. What's the metric conversion on that? Do we know anybody? Uh, okay. Finally. Um, so I'll start with 180 and, and we're, we're going to get into the finishing process. I start with a coarse grit. And then before I go any further to any other grits, I will inspect this and see if there's any shiny spots. Shiny spot would be a low valley in the resin, which means that, you know, it's, it's low. The sand... It, it hasn't been sanded. You want the whole thing to be white and frosty. So if there is a low spot at that point, you can put another coat of, of resin on just to build that up a little bit. It'll be a lot easier because it'll be more smoother and definitely try to keep the drill rolling so you don't have that drip. Okay. At this point, if I'm, I'm comfortable with, with how that looks, I will then go through all my dry sanding grits uh, from uh, 120 all up to 600 in a dry sanding application. At that point, I do one more inspection, and if I'm feeling good, I actually like to put another coat of CA on it. And I will usually use a thin, which we have over here. I'm gonna spill, I'm gonna leave a stain here, I'm sure, I'm gonna leave my mark. So putting a CA uh, finish on this, you want the drill to be moving, sort of medium speed, And I just put a bead and just wipe that. And what that does is sort of fill in any miscellaneous, um, miscellaneous sandy grits, but it also gives me a, an idea what this thing's going to look like when it's polished. It, and it's, I just find that to be a, a, a real nice way um, of, of sort of getting started in the polishing. Now, some people say, well, I can stop right there. And you can. So now the level of polish is totally up to you. It's really a subjective. If you give it to your mother-in-law and she's got bad eyesight, uh, I can stop here and call it a day. But if my wife is going to see it, I want to make sure I'm going <laughs> to raise the level. So there's a variety of ways you can do this. You can stop at 600 and use Yorkshire grit. And they make a micro uh, fine polishing grit. This is p designed to polish resins. And the way this grit works, they actually say you can stop at 240. Oh no, that's for the other Yorkshire grit. I don't know what you can stop at this. So let's just we gotta take it to 600. Um, you take a paper towel, you wipe a little on, 
Make sure you get it covered. And just crank this baby up, and we're gonna wanna go to the high speed. And I'll rub this out. Yorkshire grit breaks down as you, uh, as you polish or buff with it. So it starts at a coarser grit. I know the standard Yorkshire grit starts at 240 and ends at 1,000. And I apologize, I don't know the numbers uh, on, the, on the microfine. And this is a very easy way to uh, polish a ring. And I just polish it until it's dry. And I don't know if you can see, that's pretty shiny there, right? And again, that's, that's, that's probably the fastest way you can go. Now, the resin people, they want to be a little more uh, precise or a higher polish. And I'm not sure if I 100% agree with this for this type of inlay. I would do it for, um, for clear resins. Like if you're making a clear ball and you're looking through it, that's where you really need the super high polish. But um, this kind of inlay and pens, um, I usually do this, but sometimes I don't. Again, it depends what, what level I'm looking for. Uh, so micro finishing pads are pads designed to be for wet sanding. I don't know the order of this. Oh, we, we have them. Oh, look at that. Did you write this or is this part of your system? So they usually start at 1500 grit. They've labeled them and we're missing some, but, oh, here we go. So they come with a card, right? So it's 1500 all the way down to 12,000 and they're color coded, but I don't know, you're color blind, I can't see it, so. Uh, one trick, I'm just going to, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One great trick is stack them up like this. Take a magic marker and draw a line like this and then an angled line. Right? So now... If one is out of order, you can see it. Okay, so that's a great trick of being able to re-get them in order. I mean, I, I like to use the card, but I lose it. Like I already lost this one, right? I already lost it. Um, so I meant to do that, now oh, here it is. So if you lose this and you can't understand the color, like they have a teal and a blue and a blue, you know, they, the colors kind of blend in together once they get used. So that's a great trick of uh, keeping track. Um, some people also make a board with a bunch of kerf marks in them and you can kind of keep them in order. That's probably the best way to do it. You take one out, use it, you know where it goes back in because there's only one slot that's there. Um, but these are used for wet sanding and this really takes it to a much, much higher level. I'm not going to do all of this, but again, the wet zone here, so bear with me. So again, you're just going to go through each grit, rinsing a couple times, and so on and so forth, working my way all the way up. This will give you a much finer polish. And um, I would then dry that off. Now from there, Again, this might be acceptable enough, and a paper towel works, and I can do um, polishing compounds. So there's automotive polishing compounds, 3M, uh, or I don't know if you carry Nova is another one, Magic Juice, there's a variety of polishing, if they have different levels, and it's just grits in a liquid, and you can use polishing compounds. Or you can use um, polishing paste, so usually, usually in uh, these Dremel tool kits, everybody has a Dremel tool kit, right? I mean, it's like grandpa's got one, right? In every one of those, they usually come with a little wheel like this, right? Little polishing wheel and polishing compound. So usually you want to start with a triple E, uh, trip, not E, triple E, yeah, triple E. It's red. Um, that's a coarser. And then there's a PBC, plastic buffing compound. And usually it just takes these two. And I would simply turn this on, grab a little of that, turn this baby on, and polish that. And then I would switch to the, uh, switch to the other compound. And often I will then buff it just with a, a, a raw 
pad, and that will bring it up to the highest uh, sort of optically clear um, level that you can. So again, the polishing, there's a variety of, of levels. Um, I can pass this around. I don't know. Actually, well, I'll pass this around. You can keep, uh, I'll keep talking if you want to pass that around. Um, so any questions on the polishing uh, side of things or what I've called through so far? Good. So the next thing you want to do is take this thing off. Oh, and guess what? Who wants to guess what I did wrong on this one? Didn't have any, I didn't have any Teflon tape. So, oh, I did. Just not on the inside one. So, we're going to go ahead and peel that off. Yeah, so that's what happens when you don't, I did that, so I'm driving that point home. You want to use Teflon tape. So, last bit is you might have a little, a little, oh, there's a good piece of the rubber. You might have a little, what's called flash. You know, it's a little the CA that kind of got on the Teflon tape and it leaves a little, little uh, thing there. So I would take 600 grit paper for that. And um, I usually sand, sand sort of at a 45 degree angle. I don't know what the metric conversion of that is, um, but uh, that kind of breaks that up. And you really want to just do this by, by feel. Sometimes there might be a little bumpiness on the inside. So you're just going to kind of go around and, and sand that out with 600 grit. And then from there, you can use your, you can jump right to the polishing compound. Since it's the inside of a ring, you don't sort of need that optically clear all the steps. I mean, if you're in anal retentive, go for it. But I usually just sand it so it feels smooth. And then I take the Triple E and the PBC and I go in and buff that out. And then I will buff that with, with the, 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 the regular polishing compound. And then, and there you go. So this one's not finished. But here are some other rings. Did you pass here? There's some other rings. I'm going to hold on to one here. So th this is, is that a ceramic? Yeah. This is some um, opal ones. So I'm going to quickly review how you would do this with opal. Okay. So any questions on the PowerShell? Yeah. Uh, would it be similar with uh, uh, gold Yeah. Great question. So with the metals, same sort of thing. Now the one thing, again, we carry, can I have this little starter kit right there? That one right there. No, next one over. That's it. So um, we also carry um, metal leaf for gilding. We actually carry leaf or in flake. Um, one reason we did the flake is because it's shredded as opposed to taking leaf and shredding it because it doesn't shred as easily. Plus, it's less expensive per square foot because it's all sort of sweepings off the floor. Um, just as a side note, this is not real gold, okay? It's, oh, real gold. No. It's brass alloy and uh, aluminum, aluminium, sorry. And, um, and this is real copper. How do you say copper? Kappa. No, you say kappa. Okay, anyhow, so you can take this and use that. Um, the one sort of thing is that this stuff does fold onto itself quite a bit. So I would like to either use thin CA glue, so capil capillary, is, you guys say capillary. Capillary. Cap capillary. <laughs> Uh, you want it to wick in between any leaves. So I will start with a thin CA to make sure that's done. And sometimes I will take it and make a little paste, you know, because it, it'll mix together, mush in, and you can kind of almost trowel that in. Okay, so if you want to do metal leaf, that's a great option. Um, so I thought I had metal leaf. Well, I think that ring I passed around. Um, so we're getting back to the opal. Well, actually, here's a metal leaf. This is the metal leaf over the power shell. And we, they also carry sheets. Do you have carry sheets? Not yet. Okay. So, but you can, you know, put it over the top. So if you could put the, 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 the strip in there and then put little bits of, of the leaf on top of that to kind of mix it up. Real fun to play with. If you want to do with opal, pretty much the same um, process. I would put a little bead of medium on there and then take the power shell Mm, not the PowerShell, the, you know, I had this all laid out and then all hell goes to loose. Tweezers, here we go. I would take, I'm trying to work over here because I think this is probably the best angle. Is it? Oh, I know what I should do. Uh, 
I'm going to put this back here. Am I still, I'm still, at, I, and then I can put this here. Here we go. No, I'm all good. Thank you. So what I will do is take uh, these little trays, which are great for um, distributing and holding and sorting the powish, the, the opal. Take the little opal out. Uh, you can work out of the jar, but it's just a lot easier to sort of sprinkle some here because they are different sizes. Um, and I had tweezers here right here. And I would take a little of the CA glue. I'll just do a little, little drop here. This is the medium. You would go through all of the same prep as before. Cutting on the brand new bench. Half off. Um, put a little bead of CA here. And then I would kind of sort this out come through here with my tweezers and I like to place these in one at a time. Okay. I know some ring makers do this and they just dump it in there and they have a tray down below and they just kind of dump and press with their fingers. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I sort of like to do it this way. It gives me a little more control and I can manipulate these pieces around. Obviously I can only do, you know, an eighth of the ring at a time, hit it with a little CA glue and I can continue working. What I often will do is sort of go once around this way, but then there'll be little voids on either side. So then you can take the opal and with a mortise and pestle or a, I like a mortise and pestle, but you can use a, a hammer or a spoon and you can crush this stuff up. And then if you get a little sink drain, those little baskets that go in your sink, sink drain or a fish scooper, I actually have used both of them. I use a sink drain to sort of sort out one grit and then a fish screen is a little finer and I just kind of keep doing, I usually get three sort of piles. I get the dust, which I don't use, although you can. I like the, the next in between. They're like half mil to one mil size and then you can go around and fill in all those little voids that, that might be showing up. Okay, so that's how, but I do like the larger chunks um, because everybody else who sells the opal has it ground really fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes, there is, but it's too, too little, it's too fine. I like the large facets and the big things of flare. I use the fine stuff to fill in the bits. So that's, we have it ground just for us uh, to our specs on, on, on this side. So that's how you can do that opal. Do we have that little dish, that little round thing I, hand, I passed out? Little, nobody leave. No. <laughs> um, but as you can see, not only for rings, but it's great for, um, where's our cameraman? There, there we go. Um, it's great for filling in rims if you're a turner, but if you have a crack in a wood, like that pen I turned around, if you have a little crack, instead of trying to hide it with black wax or, or, or whatever, you put some of this stuff in there and man, everybody's like, whoa, what is that? It just raises it. I like that wow factor. I, I just, I, I just love it. That's why I, I was, that's why I do this. I specialized and then people, all my students wanted, where do you get it? Where do you get it? So then we started, I mean, COVID was great for us because everybody's home crafting and that's how we started the sort of the business and it kind of took off. So thanks again. Uh, one side note is um, the any iridescent material, not just opal, but mother of pearl, mica powders, the iridescent is enhanced by a black background or a dark background. So this in fact is the same opal, but this is in natural maple, right? Doesn't, you know, it, it kind of pops, but um, when it's on black, it really pops. Is that in focus? I can't tell. So how about we try the overhead camera? I don't know if you can see the two different uh, colors. So it's important to have a dark background. Now the Bacote is dark enough. You don't need to paint it, but you can paint it with a black a pigment or use a black CA to kind of get it darker. That's if you're doing any other side of inlay. So how, uh, anybody, anybody have any questions on so the big picture opal inlay? We good? Okay, so now the best part. Oh, and as a side note, um, I also designed a uh, ultimate router base. So for you woodworkers out there, there's a router base there. So I teach 
of the inlay and curved joinery. So if you're doing like a demi lune table or an oval table and you want to put a hardwood edge on it, how do you put, match that French curve? Not a radius, but a French curve. So this will, that's how I designed this. And basically I want to go out and buy like a one and a half inch or whatever the millimeter conversion of that template guide. Nobody makes it anywhere in the world, like period. So I started turning them on a lathe. And then um, I said, well, my students were working on using a router and when you were doing edge work, the center of gravity is hanging off the edge, right? And it tilts, never happens to any of us, but you know, sometimes you ruin the edge. So if you have an extended router base, it helps shift the weight in, gives you more control, more precision. But I wanted an offset router base that accepted the template guide. Again, nobody makes it. So I suddenly realized, okay, there's a void in the market. I mean, so I started making them just for my students and then it kind of took off from there. So it took me 10 years to, and many prototypes. And besides just those two features, there's a whole bunch of other features. Axminster on their website, go there. It'll show you all the features. It fits a bunch of routers. It, it's just like the universal tool. So that's another thing that they uh, picked up. So thank you, Axminster. Um, and again, on my website, I've got how-to videos, but that's the, sort of the whole line. Uh, oh, and I was at the, so we need, how are we going to give away? We have, where's my, over here. We have a free giveaway. So let's see, uh, Carden, give me a, a month and a day. Okay, whose closest birthday is to April 27th? You don't tell me your age. What's your birthday? What you? What number do you say? So you're the 29th. Are you an Axminster employee? Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so there's the there's the that's the inter, that's the interactive portion of the demonstration. Um, so again, imagine woodworking. If anybody has any questions, I. Uh, teach all over the world. I teach remotely. I answer questions all the time. Um, I don't always, you know, if I'm traveling, I don't always get to them, but you're welcome to, 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 you know, email me or what have you. Certainly patronize Axminster. This is a great new facility and store and quality products. So uh, I hope you guys learned something. If you didn't learn anything, I hope you had some fun. That's all that really matters. And uh, thanks again for having me over here and I uh, hope to see you next year. Uh, so we'll be back. Okay. Thanks again.